Good evening, church. Um, wow, time flies. And now we are at the end of 2021. Uh, and here we are together again to celebrate the goodness of the Lord. All right, why don't you get your Bible ready? Um, this evening, we want to study the Word of God together as we celebrate this beautiful day. And we want to give honor and glory only to Him and Him alone, only to Jesus our Lord. He is the reason for the season. He is why we are here. He is why we worship Him. He is why this, you know, event, this uh, festivities at the end of the year called Christmas is all about. And I want to share with you about generous love. You know, this is not just a title of my sermon, but, you know, generous love is truly the name of our Lord. We know that as we open the Bible, you know, the Bible would give, uh, would, would, would teach us the name of our Lord. You know, he's known as Jehovah, Jehovah Shammah. He's known as Jehovah Jireh, you know, which is the Lord, my provider. He's also known as Jehovah, as, as El Shaddai, the Lord that is abundant, you know, the abundant suppliers. So he's also known as love. You know, uh, the Bible teaches us that God is love. But more than just He is love, what kind of love it is? Because when we talk about love, there's so many expressions about love. And you know, I think it is fitting if you have been coming to church lately, you know that we've been talking about generosity and gratitude. And today, I think the culmination of all that we have learned comes down to this season, to this day, as we learn about our Savior Jesus, that indeed, he is the generous love embodied in person, in persona. So generous love is not just a sensation. It's not just, uh, you know, a phenomena, but it is imperson, impersonate in the person of Jesus Christ. He is not just love, but he is a generous love. So that being said, let's open together the gospel of Matthew chapter 2. Um, usually every Christmas we begin by reading about the story of Jesus' birth from the Gospel of Luke. But this year we want to speak from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Magi, which was known as the kings, the leaders, you know, the wise men in some translation says, and they all came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Of course, this is not just, you know, a, a, a weird uh, request. But we know if we study from the Old Testament, you know, his birth, you know, his uh, coming to this earth has been prophesied even even to this day, even, even to the very detail of what was being uh, asked by the Magi. You know, we learn in the book of Isaiah, it says that the people who walk in the darkness have seen the light. All right? The people who walk in the darkness have seen the light. And they ask, when King Herod heard this, verse 3, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called Magi secretly and found, uh, uh, secretly and found out from them the, the exact time the star had appeared. There he requested them. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them. Until it stopped over the place where the child was. So, What's interesting here is that uh, uh, unlike the you know, Christmas legend that we grew up in Sunday school, at the writing of this uh, passage, actually Jesus is already estimated to be a toddler, not a baby anymore. It's a child there, there where the child was. 
When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. You know, it's a very colorful story surrounding the birth, you know, the ushering of Messiah into this world. You know, in other passages we learn that in the midst of the darkness, how shepherds in the desert at the dark of night, in the middle of the night, all of a sudden heaven was open and the whole majestic choir of the angelic hosts were shouting glory to God in the highest. Imagine if you were that shepherd. You know, um, I don't know. If I were me, I would probably, you know, uh, piss in my pants. I don't know. It's, 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 you know, in the midst of a pitch black darkness, all of a sudden heavens was open and then there's a shout. You know, so it's, 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 and, but yet again, you know, from the perspective of uh, Joseph and Mary, it's a quiet, unassuming night as they are making their way. Um, that is what gives um, um, inspiration to the song that we sing every year, you know, which is a silent night, you know. For them, it's quite a uh, silent, quiet, unassuming. No one is paying attention to them. But at the same time, you know, we know that what was crafted, what was said since the beginning of the fall of man in the book of Genesis, it all comes into that divine intersection of the birth of our Savior. So I want to share with you uh, the main text this morning, uh, this evening that, uh, that, that we are to learn together. And I hope that when we learn this passage together, you guys will not dismiss it as something that, oh, I already knew that, you know. You know, this is what, what is interesting to me as a believer, as a pastor, as a student of the Word of God, is that many times, because we think it's obvious, we dismiss the mystery of the Word of God. You know, the Word of God is the same. The Word is the same. You know, you read it last year, the same verse. It is the same Word, the same writing today, like or 10 years from now. But then again, the inspiration that is behind it, the life that is with it, is different depending on the time or the seasons that you are in. Because of the Holy Spirit that breathed life into the Word of God. We are at the danger of dismissing the blessings of God because many times we think, oh, isn't it obvious? But you have to understand that uh, it's not always like that. So let's turn together to John chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. The Gospel of John chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. I am reading from the New King James Version. John chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. All right. So... Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned but he that believeth not is condemned already because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So, you know, um, like I said earlier, many times we're trapped, you know, uh, in the mindset of, oh, isn't it obvious? We have to understand that just because it's obvious to you or it's obvious this time doesn't mean it, it's not oblivious to some, piece, to some people. You know, I, I was... I was um, uh, look, I was watching the old story of uh, Tim Tebow about the John three sixteen stories. How at one point when he was playing um, uh, football and the final in one of the game of uh, I think it was Florida Gator, right? Florida Gator, and you know Tebow being a believer, you know he would you know how a, a football player they would put a black. Uh, mark streak on their and just underneath their eyelid to they say it's to deter the reflection from the light or something help them to have a better focus 
But what happened was sometimes, you know, many times, so it's not just streak of black, but they would r- write something on it, right? So for, for the longest time, Thibaut has wrote Philippians 4.13, I can do all things. But then again, in that final game, you know, he, he felt such a, such a push in his spirit to change it to John 3.16, so, I mean, if you grew up in a church, if you've been a Christian all your life, you know John 3.16. You know it. You've read it. I think it's probably the first verse that was being taught in Sunday school or something. But then again, you know, in that historical game, um, uh, without going into deep into all the stats and the amazing facts, you can just Google it or, or you know, search it on YouTube, Tim Tebow, uh, John 3.16 stories. What was interesting that after the game, you know, one of uh, the PR uh, uh, called his coach and says, and his coach would tell team that, you know, during the game, approximately 90 million people Google John 3.16. You know, John 3.16. They, 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 they Google John 3.16. You know, so apparently because it's obvious to you, it doesn't mean it's, obliv- it's not oblivious to other people. You may know it well, and even for those of us who know it, then we are in the danger of, you know, dwelling on the past obvious, missing the today's revelation. You know, uh, I read an article about how, you know that when you are in in, in the aviation industry, you know, um, there's a danger that plague uh, our uh, flight industry, and it's a very uh, powerful, but actually it's a very simple, it's flying birds. You know, according to FAA report, there are so many flights that were down or uh, experiencing so much uh, uh, um, accident because of birds flying into the path, either on the windshield or get sucked into their turbine. So what happened was, you know, um, a lot of this uh, aeronautic uh, aerospace research center, uh, they develop a testing um, device. You know, if you saw in the automotive industry, they have what's called the dummy, crash test dummy, you know, with a lane. So in the aviation industry, they have the same thing also. And, 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 and they invented what's called the chicken gun. <laughs> so it's, it's like it's an odd-looking shape. This is real. I'm not making this up. You know, it's like a long pipe, you know, with a, 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 a huge compress, uh, uh, compressed air. And it shoots something uh, projected uh, into the, you know, the mock-up of a flight. And the ammunition is a dead carcass. So they try to simulate it, uh, the same mass weight of uh, flying birds, you know. And there's a funny urban legend story that is circulating, you know, how the FAA one time was contacted by uh, the British um, um, high-speed train authority. And they say, can we borrow yours so that we can test our high-speed train, you know. So this gun, you know, uh, shoot you know, dead carcasses or chicken, you know, they, they, they use chicken sometimes in a, in, in a, in a high velocity speed onto the, onto the windshield or the body of the plane. So the British Railroad Division borrowed it and they, when they did a test on their high speed train, what happened was it shattered the windshield, it broke the, the, the chair of the engineer and it got lodged into the wall of the cabin, you know. So they took picture and then they send it to FAA. They say, what do you think? What do you make of this? So the FAA, after careful you know, consideration, they reply back in a simple sentence. And they just say, use, you know, thaw the chicken first. <laughs> so apparently they use frozen chicken. This is another lesson to us. Just because it's obvious to you doesn't mean it's oblivious to other people. All right. Just because we've heard John three sixteen, you know, all our life doesn't mean you know it could, you know, uh, some people might get lost on it. And the truth is that you know, just like what Tim Tebow did, you know, ninety million people Google John three sixteen because they don't know what it is. And even to those who grew up knowing this, it's it's very possible that we get lost in the familiar spirit and missing on what the Holy Spirit is trying to say, you know. When you look at John 3.16, you know, grammatically, there are 10 key words in this simple verse. 10 key words. God, love, world, give, son, whoever, or depending on other translation, is whosoever. 
and then the word belief, the word perish, have, and then the word life. Don't worry, I'm not going to go into each of them, each of those words, all right? But today, in our celebration today, you know, I'm just going to go into this, into this word. And I'm just going to emphasize this upon us in this statement. Because God loved, therefore he gave. So I think this is how we read this passage. Because God loved, therefore he gave. Because the truth of the matter is that the whole world have their own idea about when you are in love, what do you do? But the truth of the matter is that sometimes what they think is love is actually lust. What we need to understand is that in the equation of God, love is always giving. But the truth is that the word always taught us that, you know, you know the sensation of love is in what you are getting. You know, I, I, it's, it's very easy. You can just Google it up, you know, in the super uh, information superhighway. There are so many articles about craziest thing people have done because in the name of love. You know, I read how a guy, you know, stole the corpse of his love interests <laughs> and, and, you know, kept it at home, you know. I don't know if that's love or psycho, but in the end, you know, it's all because they want to satisfy him themselves. It's in getting. It's not giving. But in this passage especially, I want you to learn this Christmas. Please don't miss this. We celebrate this every season, every year. But, you know, if I can use my energy and not waste my opportunity, I'd like to contribute on this thought and, 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 and to remind you again you know, uh, as obvious as John 3, 16 may be on you, but today you need to understand that because God loved, he gave. You know, so that's his reflex. You know what a reflex is, right? You know, when, whenever you unknowingly touch something hot, your reflex is you, you know, you pull back your hand as quick as possible, okay? So it's almost as if this is his reflex. This is God is synonymous. His love is synonymous. In, in, the, in, the, in the dictionary, in the vocabulary of God, it is impossible that when he loves, he doesn't give. You know. Um, and, and why is this definition important? Because we're living in a society, we're living in a day and age where the understanding, the meaning of love is so corrupt, is so muddled, is so confused. Love is... You know, it has always been, you know, centered at self-experience. But for him, it's not that. We're going to learn later on. But this is what we need to understand today as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. You know, the whole story about this, it's telling you about a God who is madly in love with you. And it's interesting, it didn't say, for God so loved the church. It means God loved the world, the messed up world that is deep, you know, neck in sin. God loves them to the point that he gave. And we all know that he didn't just give any ordinary gift, but he gave his only begotten son. You know, for, to those of you who, do, who don't understand what it means, only begotten son, it means his one and only son. His one and only son. His one unique son. You know, so he didn't just give one out of 10,000. He gave the one. The last one. The only one. You know, and this is consistent to what we've been learning all these times. You know, when we, we've been talking about generosity. And we're not original when we talk about generosity. Because generosity begins with God. Our God is a generous God. Last week we learned from John chapter 10 verse 10. Because God comes to give that we may have in abundance. He come to give. This is another word. John 3.16 is another word that gives an emphasis on the true nature of God. He's not just a giving God but he's a loving God. And his kind of love, the way he loves is that when he loves, he gives. 
Because there's no telling what you would do when you are in love. There are those of you that when you are in love, you get very selfish. You get very isolated. You get very exclusive. But not so with our Lord. When He loves, He gives. Think about it for a second. Because that tells a lot about who He is. You know, so that's why you know, I've been saying this for the umpteenth time. That if you have problem with giving, if you have problem with generosity, then you just don't understand the gospel. You just don't understand the God that you worship. Because He is a generous love. You know, and, and we learn also that God did not just give an ordinary gift. So I want to give you, you know... Simple points that we can take out from this, you know, short verse of John 3.16. The first thing is that, you know, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. This is what we can learn. The first thing is that generous love is proactive. Generous love is proactive. Remember, generous love is a reference to God. It's one of His names. You know, so I underline the word God there because you need to understand that it was Him who take the initiative to approach you. It was him who traveled the eternity, you know, the infinity, and come to the finite being, to finite realm, this world, just to reach you. For God so loved the world. So he's proactive. He took the first step. He took the initiative. He's not dormant. He's not passive, but he's proactive. It makes you wonder what the church looks like these days. If we confess to be worshiping Him. If we confess to be the church of the living God. If we confess to be followers of Christ. That's what Christian means. Follower of Christ. Are we proactive in our generosity of loving people? Are we proactive? Do we take the first initiative? Are we proactive or are we reactive? You know, we're always waiting for other people. We're always waiting until there's no other choice. Okay. No, 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 no. God in the beginning has always take the lead. So I, I believe that as a believer, if we are to live the true spirit of Christmas, is that as a believer, as a Christian follower of Christ, we must be at the forefront of meeting people need. We must be at the forefront To give. We must be at the forefront who first notice the suffering, the injustice of the people around us. You know, find a need and fill it. This is the true nature of generous love. It's not a selfish God that we worship. But sometimes we can interpret it, His blessings, His privilege, His favor... With a selfish ulterior motive. But his intention when he blessed you was never so that you will be blessed and it stop at you. But in the beginning he was clear. I will bless you so that you will be a blessing for other people. Generous love is always, he has always been proactive. He took the first initiative. We're not original in our generosity. We took it after our God. We took it after our Father. You know, how many times we, you know, get it backward. When we look at a little kids and then we saw their parents. Oh, you look like him. (laughs) You know, whenever, you know, Jeffera was very uh, little, you know, we always say, oh, his face really look like, uh, you look like him, Jane. (laughs) We get it backward. He got it from his mama. (laughs) You know. So, if the world is to look at us, people who dub themselves as follower of Christ, is it going to give him an accurate depiction of who God is? As a God who is not only loving but generous. As a God who always takes the first initiative at meeting other people's need. I mean, that's a rhetorical question, but it's something worth pondering for all of us, especially as we are celebrating this every year. How have we changed since the last celebration we did? All right? 
John 3.16, For God so loved the word that He gave. He gave. You know, godly love must overflow into generosity. Godly love is such a force that cannot be contained. You know, it's like trying to keep fire underneath your shirt. It will consume you. If what you have is godly love and it's not a selfish love, it is impossible for you not to have an overflowing. In fact, you will burst out of the seam if that is what you have. Once the Holy Spirit is living in you and in control of you, it's impossible for you to keep living the same life that you've been living and not care for the cry out of other people. And not care for the injustice that you see. And not care for the poverty around you. And not care for those who are in need. And not care for those who are marginalized, rejected, outcasted. Those who did not know who God is. It's impossible for you to keep silent. To be passive. To be in apathy. I pray this evening that the Holy Spirit will refresh us again and fill us again with not just love, but a godly love. That He will be overflowing in us again. And then in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. You know, this is what we learned that generous love is costly. It doesn't come cheap. We receive this for free, not because it has no value. We receive this for free. He paid for our sin at the cross. It's, it's free not because it's cheap, but because if we were to be charged, we, none of us can afford it. That's why he made it free for us. You know, generous love is because his only begun son. It, is, it, is, it doesn't come cheap. I, I, I remember, you know. In one of the interviews, John Glenn, the late John Glenn, you know, one of the first men who walked on the moon, and also a senator, you know, he passed away at the age of 95, I believe. In one of the interviews, this is what he says. I guess the question I'm asked the most often is, John, when you were sitting in that capsule listening to the countdown, how did you feel? <laughs> Well, the answer to that one is easy, he said. I felt exactly how you would feel if you were getting ready to launch and knew you were sitting on top of two million parts and built by the lowest bidder on a government contract. <laughs> you know, in a government tender project, the government always pick the lowest bidder. But we all know that when it comes to Quality, you know, cheaper is not always better. So that's what John Glenn says. Oh, you want to know how I feel? Ten. Nine. Oh, I wonder if they screw this. They tight. This, this screw is tight enough. Oh, I wonder if, you know, uh, the hit sink ceramic is properly, you know, because thank God we did not, you know, salvation was not delivered to us on the lowest bidder. But salvation was given to us on the highest bidder. His only son. You know, no one else, nothing else. What we receive is not cheap. It's costly. You know, it's costly. How many of you understand this principle? The value of your gift is not how much it costs, but how much it costs you. Hello? Because there might be a price affixed to that device, $20. But if you have been out of work, left with only $5 for the rest of the month, and you're still trying to get it, and for some reason you manage to get it and give it to somebody else, it's not the $20 that you're giving. But what it costs you is riding on that gift that you give to that person. So the real value is not in the nominal value. How much, it's not on the price tag. It's not how much it costs. But it's how much it costs you to get it. And we all know what it costs God. 
His one and only Son. Generous love is costly. And my last point is Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not only is the one who is proactive and take the first initiative. But love in His book, it has got to be concrete. It's not abstract. When God says He loves you. He's not talking in a sense of conceptual, but it's substantial. He's demonstrating it to you. He will demonstrate. You will see. You will feel it. He's not one who is just contemplating on saving you. But he's the one who is already in the deep of it, rescuing you and I. He demonstrates his love. So, for the... For the limitation of word, I put a, I word it as generous love, but it's beyond that. The love that God has is always demonstrative to us. It, it's, it's not love from a distance, you know, these days with all the gadgets and the necessity, the ease of technology that we have, it's so easy to appear to be caring from a distance. It's, it's easy, oh, we, we have equate. Genuine caring to just a short text message. Oh, I'm praying for you. I care for you. Well, don't get me wrong. Sometimes that's the only thing that we can do. But if we are honest, for the most part, we have just resort to just that. And we felt good because we thought, oh, we have tried. You know. That's why, you know. One of the aspects about generosity, and especially generosity in giving, is that God is teaching us the value of sacrificial giving. And you all know that our God is not one who teaches us something by just teaching, but He's the first who demonstrated for us. For while we were still sinning, He demonstrated His love by dying on the cross for us. I want to encourage you this morning, church, and I pray that this, this evening, <laughs> I keep saying morning, I pray that as, as we celebrate Christmas yet again this year, as we remember about Jesus Christ, don't just remember him, you know, in a casual tone, uh, in, 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 you know, oh, you know what, it's obvious what you are saying. You know, just because it's obvious to you doesn't mean it's oblivious to other people. There are those who, are, who don't understand. And even if you've known it then, does not guarantee that you know the revelation for today, the fresh revelation. The book of Lamentations says that His grace and His mercy are new every morning. So if His grace and mercy are new every morning, I take it that His revelation, His inspirations are also new every morning. So we can't. Be living life thinking that, oh, you know what? I know all there is to know about God and His wisdom. You miss out big times. So I pray that we don't fall short at just annual celebration of Christmas. But I pray, I beg of you this evening that you would open your heart, that you would open your mind, that you would understand that the Savior that we worship the Savior that we celebrate, number one, He is the one that is loving. And in His love, He demonstrates His love by being generous and in giving to you and I. How will it be for you and I? Because He loves, He gives. Now, I want to close with the verse, the passage that we read, Matthew chapter 2, about the story of Christmas from the point of view of the Magi. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 to 12, but just focus on verse 11, when they finally met the child, when they finally met the child Jesus. Look at this. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures. So usually when I read this passage, 
All we got is, oh, you, know, you see, they gave their treasure to God. Because this is also the fulfillment of a prophecy. Kings will come and lay treasures on his feet. You know, but what I miss is that before they open their treasure, they first give their heart to Jesus. You see, the word they bow down and worship, that word worship there is the Greek word proskuneo. The word proskuneo, it means to bow down, to prostrate, to fall prostrate, and to kiss, like kissing a hand. And we all know that every time there's kissing involved, it's not just honor, but it's love. In fact, it's the, one of the most purest form of, you know, in the Bible, the kind of love and adoration that you give to someone. Proskuneo, kissing and prostrating. So you have to see the beauty of what is being said here. Because God loved, He gave. And how does the kings of the world respond? They love him back. And in return, they also give. I pray that we don't break the cycle, the example that has been painted so beautifully in the Bible. One day, Pastor Ron and I, I think we, we, we went back, we went to Rochester for our ministry. Uh, well, I, I don't think it's, it was with you. I don't know if it was with you or with my family. But we went to a drive through I think it was with DP. <laughs> we went to a drive-thru because we tried to eat on the run. We tried to make it on time in Rochester. And to our surprise, when it comes to our turn to pay, you know, the clerk says, oh, it's already been paid. So the car before you already paid. It was with you, I think, right? Just not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So apparently they have this social experiments of paying backward or paying forward. I don't know. So and I heard the longest it has been is like 100 cars or something. So while it was interesting, you know, I was like, oh. And then we, we break the chain because we, we did not do it to the car behind us. <laughs> Shame on us. <laughs> but I do believe that generosity should be more than just experiment. It should be a life commitment. It should be how you live your life. And you know, sometimes people would do this social experiment just to be a content, to be seen by other people. But let me tell you something in the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's not what people see, but it's what your Lord see. That's what it counts. You know. So because he loved, he gave. And in return, the kings of the world, they love him back. And then they give to him. I pray that you and I did not miss this. I pray that you, you and I did not dismiss this as something that, oh, I already know. But I pray that this evening, that we will receive a fresh revelation of the word of God. That because we worship a generous love, we in turn will be people who are generous and loving. I think this is what Christmas is all about. Celebrating not only the salvation of humanity, but he who is one that shall save us. He's a generous God. He's a loving God. And if we are to accept him and embrace him into our life, I pray to God that the Holy Spirit will transform us to become the most loving and the most generous people on this planet. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your generosity. We're so grateful for Jesus. As we celebrate Christmas yet again, oh God, this year, I pray that your people don't miss the true understanding and the true meaning of what Christmas is all about. Father, I pray that you will move our heart, that you will move our mind. Father, I pray that you will cause us to respond to your invitation. Love is not about getting, but love is about giving. Help us, oh God. Maybe we've come to a conclusion that, oh, you know what? I'm a loving person, Pastor. But 
To think that we are loving without ever checking whether or not we're generous would be misleading, would be deceiving. But I pray that we don't just change the behavior. Because what we believe is that believing matters. Believing matters. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believe. I pray that before we change the behavior, I pray that tonight we will change our belief system. Because it's easy to just start a habit. Oh, you know what? I want to be more giving. But your heart, because you can give without loving. But when you love, it's impossible that you're not giving. So Lord, help us, oh God, to get the heartbeat of Christ. As we celebrate, as we honor you this Christmas. I pray, Lord. Are you going to cause everyone who can hear the sound of my voice, whether in this room or through the electronic transmission, at home, across the country, everywhere they are, that they will take it seriously how they will turn to be upon receiving Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I pray this morning, O oh God, that we become transformed the same way to be Christ-like. To be not only loving, but to be generous. To be not only generous, but generosity that is motivated and empowered by love for God and love for other people. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray this morning, this evening, as we celebrate Christmas, as we honor Christ, help our heart to be in line with your word. Help us not to stray away Deliver us from the gospel of the world that consists solely in the principle of I, me, mine, myself. If my needs are met, as long as I'm safe, as long as I'm all right, Father, help us to live by your gospel, by your equation. Seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. What profit does a man gain when he has the whole world but lost his soul? But the Bible says that if you lose your soul because of me, you will gain it back even more. Father, I pray. I pray there's a serious alignment happening even right now as we pray. Even right now as we believe that minds begin to be aligned with your word. Hearts begin to be aligned with your word, oh God. Not just tradition, not just a good behavior, but I pray, oh God, that our beliefs begin to be aligned. I pray this evening that there's a transformation of our belief system, that our behavior will change because of our belief that has been transformed. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your selfless love. We thank you for living the comfort of your realm just to be where we are. The word becomes flesh and move into the neighborhood. And we're sorry, Jesus. It's not a good neighborhood where we are compared to where you were. But you came anyway. You walk this realm just to be with us. We want to thank you, Jesus. Help us, O oh God, to continue what you have started in us. To continue what you have started in humanity, in this universe. That in the end of our life, we're going to see you again. And you will give us that one approval nod and say, well done. My good and faithful servant. We thank you, Lord Jesus.